Hello, everybody. My name is Joshua Pasana. I'm a senior policy reporter at Politico uh, here in Brussels. And I'd like to welcome you to the second annual edition of the Sustainable Future Summit, in which we look to explore all the pressing issues facing the decarbonization push. Today's session through the afternoon focuses on mobility specifically, and I'm happy to say we have a great lineup of ministers and commissioners with us today. A few words just before we get going with our first panel. Before we begin, um, I'd like to mention that you can ask questions, but only through the Swap Card app, uh, the instructions for which you can find on our event website. I'd encourage you over the next couple of minutes to do that just while I set the things up for today. Um, I'd like to first of all thank our uh, speakers for agreeing to share their expertise um, through this afternoon's sessions. Also to our presenting partners, Cefix, Syngenta, Tetra Pak, Sanofi, and Unesda, along with our supporting partners, Alt Obsolescence Programme, Up and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They have helped make this event today possible. Um, as ever with Politico events, we like to make this an interactive session, so we're happy if you ask the question through the Swap Card app, but you can also tweet along with us today. The hashtag is hashtag Politico Sustainability, all one word, of course. Um, now, we move straight into the opening conversation. Uh, we're delighted to have with us the uh, EU Transport Commissioner, Adina Valian. Thank you for joining us. Also, uh, the Netherlands uh, Minister of Infrastructure and Water Management, uh, Cora van Neuenhausen. Uh, thank you both for joining. It's especially a really good time to start this conversation because in less than a week, uh, Commissioner, you're going to announce the EU's uh, sustainable mobility strategy. Just wondered, from your side, when you look at the kind of measures that need to be introduced over coming years to meet the level of climate ambition, um, do you have enough time leading up to 2024 to implement the measures that you want to lay out in the strategy next week? Well, thank you, Joshua, but uh, that, that's why it's called a strategy. So it maps up a vision for what we need to do in order to achieve our uh, climate targets with uh, intermediate um, uh, calls like in 2030 and uh, also for um, later on 2050, a uh, climate neutral uh, continent and with 90% reduction of emissions in transport by then. So it is uh, a long time um, um, uh, for implementing, but I need also to identify what is pragmatic to do because we need to decarbonize as fast as possible. So also looking at what benefits uh, can we have in the short term in order to act uh, as quickly as possible. And of course, depending on what we are talking about, we have uh, various um, um, years in mind in with until when we can um, uh, implement these measures. But it's important to give predictability and make a good plan from the very beginning. And you talk, you use the word pragmatism, and of course you have a split within EU countries over the level of climate ambition in various sectors. We'll get on specifically to aviation maritime later. Minister van Nieuwenhuizen, what would you say from the Dutch side? Obviously, your country is very progressive when it comes to climate mitigating uh, uh, policies. What do you think should be the priorities in this strategy? Well, I think, first of all, uh, I, I really uh, welcome uh, all the European initiatives uh, because uh, if we really want to make progress, we can only do this uh, together. Uh, the transport sector, I think, is a, plays a crucial part in the, in the Green Deal. And if we want to uh, achieve a, a climate neutral union uh, by 2050, we need to take major steps uh, today and we can discuss all the modalities uh, later. But uh, I think it's it automatically includes a wide range of, uh, of activities and measures, uh, also um, closely related to the energy transition. Um, so it's also outside uh, the deal. Uh, it should be connected to uh, road safety, to health and digitalization. I think it all uh, comes, comes together and it should be uh, intertwined. Uh, and in that way, uh, I think we can have the, poss um, the best possible results uh, as soon as possible. Okay, and, and so before we, we dig down into, into other modes of transport, just in the, the road transport, the car sector specifically, um, Commissioner, there has been some talk about whether or not the, the Commission should mandate an end point for diesel and petrol cars. Is this something that you're in favour of? And maybe we can talk about dates, but overall, do you think there should be an end date for this uh, polluting cars? 
Yes, you like this question. Huh? It came um, because it's spectacular. Um, but uh, why not talking about, for example, internalizing all the costs on the road, uh, external, externalities? Because uh, until uh, whatever we can imagine to put in place on our road, we have to enforce the polluters pay principle. So that's why I'm insisting very much for this Euro vignette to be passed. Next year, we are uh, announcing in, uh, better increased standards, CO2 standards for vehicles. Um, um, we are thinking at other methods of um, um, alter, um, uh, infrastructure for alternative fuels, recharging and refueling stations. So it's a huge, huge construction site for the road to uh, become more sustainable. I'm not ready to answer to your question because I don't know what we are going to put in place and depends on each category of vehicles. And when I said earlier that we need to be pragmatics, it means we need to decarbonize as fast as possible. If we put something like uh, um, at some point, everything will be uh, electrical. Maybe we uh, will be waiting to until that point and not doing much in the meantime. So in this sense, I was talking about pragmatism to try to use what it is um, as ready as possible on the market um, in an intelligent way so that we will gain uh, in decarbonization as fast as possible. So infrastructure, um, enough volumes of alternative fuels, um, neutrality towards technologies to see how it, uh, this develops depending on the tip, type of vehicles and then depending on the mobility. Because it's one thing to talk about sustainability in transportation in uh, urban areas, and it's another thing for um, long range and uh, heavy duty vehicles. The important thing is when we talk about road is that we need to move fast to internalize the externalities, the polluter pay principle to be in, um, in place, and then and to imagine how we make the whole system more sustainable by moving as much as uh, possible the freight from the road on a rail or inland motorway. So you see there are a lot of uh, ways in which we can tackle this other than putting an end to combustion engines. I would say that uh, liquid fuels would be very good for road transportation because it uh, is going to help us a lot um, in terms of investments for the infrastructure, acceptability by the public. So we have to keep an open mind to everything. And it might be that um, we will need um, a similar type of engine for the, this um, uh, fuels so that uh, why put an end to that uh, before you have a clear idea what you have uh, in place of it. Okay, thanks. And so you, you brought up the subject of Euro vignette, so maybe we'll just bring that forward in the conversation a little bit. Um, that's, of course, the EU proposal to reform effectively road charging schemes across the bloc. It, it's quite tough to pass a final version of this law. Uh, Minister uh, Van Neeuwenhausen, in the Netherlands, you have made efforts to, to switch to um, distance paid charging systems in certain sectors of road transport. How tricky is it to levy the cost of, um, of the pollution caused by road transport and to the sector itself with road charging schemes? Uh, well, what we try to do in the Netherlands is to help uh, the transport companies uh, to uh, be able to uh, um, uh, survive the transition that we, we need to, to zero emission. Uh, we have a lot of uh, different uh, subsidies uh, for that, um, but I think we should help also with, uh, with uh, uh, the legislative uh, proposals. Uh, some good work has already been done, but I think we really should focus uh, on uh, promoting the new uh, zero emission technologies. Uh, we cannot just uh, come with stricter CO2 norms and standards uh, for both light and heavy duty vehicles, um, but we also need to set ourselves a target year uh, for the complete phasing out of uh, fossil fuels, uh, fuel for internal combustion uh, engines, and of course the transition to zero emission mopeds by, uh, by 2030. Um, and in this respect, I would like to mention uh, that I would applaud uh, the Commission's plans to ensure a safe, circular and sustainable battery value chain for all batteries uh, capable of supplying uh, the growing market for electric vehicles. And that's difficult with um, uh, heavy uh, transport, but uh, I think that's also something that we should 
keep on uh, um, pressing and uh, encouraging. Uh, and of course, also investments uh, are required in the TNT uh, corridors and the underlying networks. Um, so uh, yearly dedicated calls uh, are needed to boost uh, market security and business readiness uh, to invest um, because it's, uh, it's a very competitive market, uh, road transport. Uh, I also agree what uh, uh, Commissioner Valian mentioned about the need for model shifts. Uh, we need more inland shipping, more rail freight uh, and less uh, road uh, transport. Uh, but we really have to combine uh, this and also help uh, the transport sector um, uh, in this transition. Okay, and, and clearly uh, the Netherlands, as we said before, is a very progressive state when it comes to, to policies around climate change mitigation. If we just switch to aviation, there, there's obviously a big discussion about taxation of the sector now uh, moving forward. Um, Commissioner Valian, do you think it's time to slap more taxes on aviation? Is that necessary? Both, of course, to, to, um, to create a, a levy for a sector that so far hasn't had so much taxation, but also separately to, to maybe try and change consumer behavior around flying moving forward. Yes, Joshua. Now with the COVID and with the completely fall down of aviation industry, it would be the right charge, a time to slap them some charges. Uh, this is to, to joke about the right time to, to slap them with something new. Uh, I think they are becoming more and more resilient with uh, so many things coming uh, uh, towards them. Um, but um, taxation, it is a very important instrument in order to obtain, um, uh, to reach a purpose. But the question is, what is the purpose you want to obtain? Because uh, if it is just to get uh, some money for uh, extra money for the national budget, and I'm saying that because I was working a lot with the environmental issues and always we were asking for the fact that the money which are gathered in environmental or climate taxes to be redirected for research um, development, the new technologies, replacement with uh, of, um, the technologies with the newer one, less um, polluting or emitting. So uh, a tax depends for what? Because if it is, for example, a tax which would um, incentivize the um, production and deployment of new alternative fuels, more sustainable um, biofuels, for example, um, um, which would um, then be used for, uh, for example, for a blending mandate. So we'll solve the problem of um, who is going to start the important production we need for alternative fuels for aviation. Because for aviation, we have to look cleaner airplanes and we have promises in um, 10 years time that we will have, uh, for example, um, um, uh, aircraft on uh, Hydrogen, uh, we see for depending on the business model, the, um, the emergency of even electrical uh, smaller planes. Um, so power to fuel, um, uh, power to liquid uh, fuels alternative, but for this we need enough production, but this needs to be incentivized. Is uh, this going to be a tax uh, used for this uh, incentivizing the production of these fuels and making a blending possible? This is a question. It has to be discussed. We will discuss anyway because we have announced that we will have an energy taxation directive discussion next year. Uh, but for aviation, for me, it's very clear that we need clear aircraft, we, cleaner aircraft. We need alternative uh, fuels. We need an improved management of the air traffic in order to be more efficient. So all of these are together ways in which we can um, reduce emissions from aviation. And then we need to have um, enough deployment of alternative suitable links uh, inside Europe so that we can replace or to be economically feasible um, um, and uh, suitable to take uh, instead of a short flight, uh, a short uh, train connection, a rapid train connection. So you see many things we have in mind and we are looking at all of them because I think all of them are needed. Understood. And Minister Van Neuenhausen, as we're just reminded, it's obviously a very serious topic, but you, your government has pushed for more tax on the aviation sector. If I understand correctly, you've exempted cargo. Just wonder if you could talk us through your policy at a national level and what you hope, given your government has been quite vocal about this, um, could be rolled out in an EU level in terms of aviation taxes. 
Uh, well, first of all, I agree with uh, Commissioner Vallian that aviation uh, will remain an essential means of transport in our global society. So also uh, in the time post-COVID-19, uh, we, uh, we need aviation. Uh, but I think we should use the momentum uh, and we need uh, and we want to build back better. Uh, so I think action is needed in, in three main areas. Uh, the first is uh, sustainable aviation, sustainable fuels. And the second one uh, is market-based measures and a carbon offset uh, through reduction in other uh, sectors. And the third is uh, alternative modes and, and measures. Um, I think in Europe, we, we need a mandatory minimum share of sustainable aviation uh, fuels from renewable sources. And together with a few uh, like-minded countries, we've already advocated uh, for this in a, in a joint statement. And the Commission has also been encouraged to invest in the market uptake of e-fuels and disruptive innovations like hybrids and uh, electric aircrafts. Uh, and I'd like to tell you that two weeks ago, I officially registered the first 100% zero emission aircraft in the Netherlands. Um, although small, uh, the general aviation uh, Pipistrel plane uh, represents, I think, uh, a milestone in flight uh, innovation. Uh, investments in disruptive technologies and components are essential for the development of hybrid and electric aviation, and it should be an integral part of the upcoming strategy, I believe. Um, uh, I think the EU needs to contribute to an ambitious long-term goal for international aviation, and of course, uh, we need to work together in, in ICAO. Uh, so we are currently working on such, uh, such a goal and I hope that we can uh, have a result um, at the ICAO uh, assembly in uh, 2022 uh, because we really need to cooperate uh, together. I also agree with what uh, the commissioner said about um, substitution uh, for short uh, um, uh, short distances uh, use uh, our trains uh, network, international trains, uh, much more than we do now. For example, we started to do that for, for six uh, directions from Amsterdam uh, to London to Paris and to Brussels. And we also identified uh, uh, three um, uh, cities in, in Germany, Frankfurt, uh, Dusseldorf and Berlin, uh, that are very promising uh, for, for substituting flights um, with, uh, with rail uh, trafficking. So um, that is, um, it, it's the whole package. Um, it's about the, the biofuels, it's, it's about the, the ground operation, um, electrification of that, uh, adjust uh, the infrastructure to that, it's about behavior. We also ask from all governments uh, to uh, use the train uh, or um, uh, electric vehicles uh, uh, more often in, instead of uh, flying. Um, of course, COVID helps us because we all are now used to uh, using the digital means uh, more like we do in this conference. Otherwise, maybe I would have uh, traveled to, to, to Brussels um, so more online seminars, etc. Uh, not for always, because uh, also we need to have uh, personal contact in the future. But I think uh, we will not go back also for business meetings. We will not go back uh, to uh, the world like it was uh, pre-COVID because, uh, well, flying to the US for, for one business meeting, probably um, more often we will use uh, um, the digital means for that. Uh, and so you, you make the interesting point about behavior here. And Commissioner, I just wonder overall, do you think ultimately it, it is sustainable that we bounce back next year after hopefully this pandemic situation is alleviated over 2021? Um, is it sustainable that we go back to the same kind of level of aviation, that we all fly as much as we did before? I, I note that you both say there's very interesting work being done on sustainable fuels for, for aviation, also on electric planes in future by the likes of Airbus. Um, but that, so those solutions won't be able to be rolled out at scale in the short term. Am I right? So, uh, listen, um, there is a reason why transport developed the way it did through various modes. And when we are approaching this subject, we have to see how we can make everything more sustainable, how we can uh, encourage more sustainable alternatives. But we are not... Um, it's very difficult to say. Uh, so starting from tomorrow, uh, people 
uh, going from Bucharest to Sofia, either you go six hours by car, either 11 hours by train, instead of half an hour by plane. So you see, um, I know there is a lot of um, uh, ambition and pioneering in the, uh, some parts of Europe, but where the infrastructure is very well de uh, developed, where services exist, where you have um, uh, companies uh, developing uh, services and businesses uh, privately to offer this kind of services, uh, alternative services to people. It's uh, difficult uh, to say, I don't know, we are going back from pandemic next year and we are going to ask uh, people um, to refrain from, uh, I don't know, uh, um, making the best use of what is available in transport. So. Um, this is what I'm saying here. Of course, I will see uh, parts of Europe moving more uh, more fast towards, um, in terms also in terms of urban mobility, we are going to raise this kind of things uh, through our strategy to see how we can encourage and incentivize uh, behavioral change, but we cannot force it. And in any way, we I can't talk about this. Uh, uh, coming back from this crisis uh, in a different way. We will come back from this crisis with uh, more ideas and more commitment and already, I hope so, investments made by uh, governments through this recovery and um, resilience fund already in uh, more sustainable alternatives. And when these are going to exist and be in place, I'm absolutely sure that people will um, will uh, prefer them. Look at uh, Madrid, Barcelona. This is a favorite example. Uh, the moment you had a um, high-speed tra train, naturally, without telling them to change any behavior, people preferred uh, to take the train instead of, uh, of a flight. But this came because the alternative exists and um, it was a natural um, uh, change made by people. I think for me, it would be difficult to say otherwise. And Minister Van Nieuwenhausen, you, we actually met when they, they launched the Eurostar connection between Amsterdam and London. You were there at the opening event for that. Um, I wonder how difficult is it to do that though, because with an air route, of course, you can just instantly get a company and, and they can make planes available to fly new intercity routes. With rail tracks, you need far more time to upgrade the routes, get new rolling stock. Um, it's been a long time that the Netherlands has been pushing the German government to improve the Amsterdam to Berlin route, for example. I is it possible that rail can take market share from flight at a, at a big scale in the years ahead? Or is this really a question for decades in the future? Um, well, I definitely think it is just part of the solution. It's not the silver bullet to solve all our problems. I totally agree with Adina. You need the infrastructure in place uh, and with uh, a heavy rail, uh, that, that's, uh, it, takes, it takes years. Um, but uh, what we try to advocate is then that on, uh, for those connections where there is a possibility, we should make the maximum use of it and uh, make sure that we... Um, uh, overcome the difficulties with uh, the the the, com com uh, the combinations of ticketing, uh, etc. So that we um, uh, at least uh, make the best of it. But I also uh, want to um, um, mention uh, our, our investments in synthetic kerosene. Uh, of course, we we are working on a biofuel uh, bio kerosene factory in the north of the Netherlands, uh, and uh, we want to, of course. Um, have uh, um, a, 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 a percentage uh, for that uh, obligatory uh, for the whole of Europe and, and even better on a, on a global scale. Um, but synthetic kerosene is also very promising. We are, are already in Europe able uh, to produce uh, um, the, the first liters. Uh, so now if we combine all our uh, 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 innovative power that we have of the different uh, the different companies and the different member states. Uh, I think we can solve that problem of scaling up uh, the production of synthetic kerosene. And um, when you can use uh, CO2, CO uh, uh, for that, uh, that would be a, a big solution for aviation uh, worldwide. So it's all the different uh, parts uh, of the solution uh, should be explored and uh, we should work on that. Uh, on the pricing of aviation is also uh, something that, uh, that influences uh, behavior, like you mentioned uh, in your introduction. So it's, it's the whole package.
Great, and and we just have a quick question returning to the aviation point, uh, uh, just in terms of taxation for the sector. Um, the understanding is that that actually the Netherlands would really like to push for an EU solution on an air cargo tax. Minister, uh, how likely is it? Do you think you can find this kind of solution at, a, at an EU-wide level? Well, um, there are more countries that already have a system of uh, of taxation uh, in aviation, and I think it's better for our European level playing field. Uh, also uh, related to to the to the global scale, uh, if we work on that uh, together, and uh, well, we started uh, with a few countries, and more and more countries now uh, see that uh, if we want to achieve the the, the, the Paris uh, climate agreement uh, goals, we need to do something, uh, and whether it's aviation or the maritime sector. Uh, each individual sector should contribute uh, to, to achieve the goals. Okay, and just a, a quick question to you both actually about some new, uh, a new report out today from the ECDC and the European Aviation Safety Agency, which says that actually um, systematic quarantine and, and testing requirements for passengers associated with the pandemic aren't actually that effective unless the country has near to a zero infection rate anyway. Um, I realize this, this is quite new news that's just come out over the last few hours, but uh, do you think overall that the, the situation with air travel throughout Europe has been handled well during the pandemic or actually perhaps now are we looking at an overreaction in terms of the restrictions that have been imposed on traffic? Perhaps Commissioner, I can ask for your thoughts first on this. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, the aviation is, is in this situation for because of the measures taken. Um, to stop the pandemic in the spring. And uh, let me remind you that uh, borders were closed, people had uh, nowhere to, where to travel. So this was a situation which was not uh, um, foreseen. But I would say that we have contributed as commission to build upon on the resilience of the sector for the eventual future crisis. And you know that through regulation and also through other measures like state aid and so on, we stepped in to help this, uh, the sector. By the other um, way around, it is also a problem of trust to travel, so for the customers, for passengers. And for this, for example, we stood tall and insisted on the fact that the passengers' rights should be respected and uh, they should be reimbursed or accept a voucher if they choose to do that. Uh, so this is uh, like a... Um, uh, systemic approach to this. We are going to propose nevertheless for the slow regulation to have a more uh, solid one uh, with measures uh, how to phase out uh, um, um, the, um, how to phase out from this um, uh, slot um, um, situation, um, but uh, this is uh, this is this was then. And now lessons learned. We had uh, issued an uh, aviation. And a safety protocol back in uh, summer, which shows what measures should be taken on board of an aircraft in airports and everywhere to protect also the workers and the passengers. We have made a scientific evaluation of the overall situation of travelers by air. We have absolutely no scientific proof that traveling as such uh, was bringing an increase in, of the numbers. And that's why you see today the protocol between us and the SDC, because nowadays in Europe, we have um, a myriad of um, measures taken. We have quarantines for travelers for two weeks. We have quarantines uh, of 10 days with uh, one PCR test or one rapid test. Another country has five days. So, so absolutely no harmonization, which is deterring, of course, uh, travel as such. And it is very burdensome for, for those who actually need to move from one place to another. And the traveler, it's not an infected person. What a traveler should be considered a person who goes to a destination and there should be treated as any other resident in uh, that uh, place of destination, obeying on the same rules uh, imposed by a member state, but consider burdensome quarantines for travelers just because they are traveling without absolutely no indication of uh, symptoms, asymptomatic or with no contact. This is uh, uh, something ECDC and DASA consider it is not recommended. And the last, and I will stop there, um, we are um, working and will be delivering um, uh, now in December with the ASA uh, to an exchange 
platform to have a harmonized and unified uh, passenger locator form in digital at European level. And that one, it will be actually really useful for member states if someone um, uh, gets ill, infected with the COVID, to put it in the system and um, uh, 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 trace contacts, uh, which were, for example, traveling with that person. Uh, and I'm uh, taking the opportunity to invite as many member states uh, wishing to join this uh, project to do so, that we will have something which would make sense at European level. And it will allow the authorities to keep uh, monitoring the travelers, but the other hand, uh, not to deter travel and uh, have a myriad of, uh, or consider a traveler to be an infected person per se. Thank you, Commissioner. And so we, we've run out of time, but the, the last word to you, Minister, just given that Schiphol is clearly one of the world's largest aviation hubs, do you think the measures to mitigate transmission of the coronavirus at airports and in the aviation sector have, have worked out well? Or, or would, if, if this situation, this horrible situation was repeated, would we do things very differently next time? Well, I think it's a bit early to uh, evaluate whether we did everything right. Um, if, if you look at the media, uh, it, it's usual uh, that the comments are it's, it, it's too little, too late. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult. We're still uh, in the middle of the, of the second wave. Uh, so we're still in the crisis. But I think um, um, I totally agree with the commissioner that what is very important that we have as much uh, harmonization on EU level uh, as possible, whether it's about the passenger locator form or it's about uh, testing, what tests, uh, etc., and how uh, to do it. It's about the quarantine. It's it's about our. Of course, in these days we are all fascinated uh, by uh, vaccination. Uh, what are the possibilities there? Uh, it, it's all about trust in, in, in travel and we should work together to, uh, to regain that as soon as possible. Okay, thank you both very much um, for your time. That was a really, a really interesting conversation. We sadly didn't get onto shipping or, or even urban mobility and e-scooters and e-bikes. There's a lot to discuss and so perhaps next time we can pick up those points. Uh, but yeah. Thank you once again to Commissioner and Minister for, for joining us today. Uh, we take a very short break now um, and we come back with a session on what will the green future of inter-European travel look like, very pertinent to the conversation we've just had uh, with my colleague Marie Eccles. Uh, so that's coming up in just a few minutes. Thanks. <laughs>